Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. <laughs> Welcome to Japan Station, a production of japankyo.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. All right, so just a quick reminder, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Japan Station is on basically, I think, all the podcast platforms, definitely all the major ones and most of the minor ones. So whatever podcast platform you use, just hit that subscribe button. It'll ensure that you don't miss any future episodes. I would greatly appreciate that. And if you can leave a rating, a review, I would also appreciate that. By the way, it seems like a lot of people are listening to the show over on the YouTube channel, on the japanku.com YouTube channel. Basically, my hosting for the podcast just automatically uploads the episodes to uh, YouTube and uh, the the views are, are increasing quite a bit. So I'm not sure what's going on over there, but um, if you're enjoying the show on YouTube, thank you. Uh, hit the subscribe button over there. Uh, that, that, that would also be great. And if you prefer to just uh, come over on Apple Podcasts or Google or Spotify or whatever it is that you listen to your you know audio content on, then hey, come on over and hit the subscribe button over there. All right. So <laughs> subscribe, subscribe. I, know, I, know, I said a bunch of times. But um, anyway, let's get to the guest today. So today you're going to get to hear a conversation with Dr. Chris McMorin. He is an associate professor of Japan Studies Today you're gonna today you're gonna get to hear a conversation with Dr. Chris McMorin. He is an associate professor of Japanese studies at the National University of Singapore, and he is the author of the very recently published book. I think it, it just came out in, in paperback. I, I, I think it basically it, it's out now. You can get it on Kindle. Uh, link in the show notes. But the title of the book is Ryokan: Mobilizing Hospitality in Rural Japan. So Ryokan are Japanese inns. There are these like traditional Japanese lodgings. Uh, They're quite popular these days, both uh, with the domestic tourist uh, market and the international, um, you know, inbound uh, tourist market. You know, it's a great way to experience something a little bit more um, traditionally Japanese as opposed to just your standard cookie cutter business hotel. You know, you go there, you can sleep in a futon. Uh, There's traditional Japanese meals served. Um, If you know, maybe a little bit on the nicer side than what you might get at your traditional um, house when your mom might just be cooking, you know, in a rush, but, you know, more traditional than, let's say, I don't know, like a Moss Burger or (laughs) something like that. (laughs) But anyway, there are these very nice, uh, you know, lodgings, inns, um, and uh, so many people, you know, get to see them and and experience this side of Japan. But what most people don't see is all that happens behind the scenes, all the stuff that the employees have to do, all the cleaning, all the preparation, and all the stuff that they they do as part of their job. Uh, and my, my guest, Dr. McMorin, he well, he did something super super unique. He basically spent a year working at a rural ryokan in Kumamoto, and uh, he just did everything like a normal Japanese person working at one of these ryokan would do. Like he would, you know, clean and and, and you know tidy up the rooms and and help uh, wash dishes and dry the car and welcome customers, uh, clients, whatever, uh, uh, the guests, I guess that's the proper word. But yeah, he would do all of this. And and he spent a year doing this. And he wrote a book based on his experience. Well, he wrote his uh, dissertation based on these experiences and then adapted that into the recently published book. Uh, So link in the show notes for Ryokan Mobilizing Hospitality in Japan. If you're a longtime listener of this show, I think you already know that I love this kind of long term anthropological study where, you know, you're in the on the ground. And, and, and writing all about, you know, the people and their lives and what they're thinking and, and your experiences. I love that kind of stuff. I've, I've interviewed so many people that have written books like that based on their research. And this is another one. Great stories. And you really get to experience through, you know, Dr. McMoran's uh, writings and experiences, you know, what it's like to be someone working in this uh, very particular industry. So let's get to it. Here is my conversation with Dr. Chris McMoran. The next stop is... Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open.
All right. So you you read the book. Thank you. I, I, yeah, no, I, I I love these kind of books. I love I love uh, learning via like these actual real world experiences and and you know getting kind of a, an insider's kind of view of of this side of Japan that few people get to see. Right? You just go, you show up, and like, oh, here's your food. Yeah, yeah. Here's your futon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, there, there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's that for sure. Interesting. Uh, um, so could you could you tell us a bit like so what's what's so I mean I, I already introduced you people kind of know it's about Ryokan but I don't know like what what's your general research and and how did you get into specifically like Ryokan? Okay, so generally, I mean, I'm a I'm a professor of Japanese studies, but my mm-hmm. PhD is in geography. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on the jet program uh, mm-hmm. in the late mid to late 1990s, mm-hmm. and when I was there, um, I was living in a city in Kumamoto City, and it was kind of a boring you know, prefectural capital, like many of the architecturally boring prefectural prefectural capitals happen to be in, mm-hmm. in Japan. And then some friends um, said, oh, let's go see kind of authentic Japan, like the real side of Japan. And we went off to Kurokawa Onsen, mm-hmm. located in Kumamoto, in the northern part of Kumamoto. Mm-hmm. And we stayed in a yokan. And mm-hmm. um, wow, it really opened my eyes to a side of Japan I hadn't experienced yet. Mm-hmm. I was still very new to Japan. So you know, um, anyone else may have said, yeah, this has always been there. It just happened to open my eyes at that moment. Uh And over time, as I spent more time in Japan, I got more interested in what made these places tick. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I hadn't stayed, I didn't travel a lot as a child. Uh, It was pretty, um, I mean, uh, poor, I think is what you would say. (laughs) We didn't do a lot of vacations and we never, you know, I didn't go overseas until I was 20 years old. So, uh, so anyway, um, I didn't have a lot of experience in hotels either, Uh but, um, what little looks I had told me that the Ryokan as a space, as a hospitality experience, as a food experience, as a kind of landscape experience was so vastly different and Mm -hmm. purposefully so. Uh, I mean, the people who were working there were trying to uh, embody some kind of Japanese identity, whether through the construction or through the hospitality or the food, as I've mentioned, even the use of language. There was nothing international about it or nothing global about it. It was really supposed to epitomize Japan. Mm. And so I was interested in this, this ongoing cultural production, this bit of work that was going on all around Japan in Ryokan at the same time that people like me were being invited in to do what they called at the time koksaika or internationalization. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like these things are are coexisting. And I also got the feeling that the Ryokan was not being really uh, created for me. It was really like for Japanese visitors. And whenever a non-Japanese person went, it was actually a struggle for the staff because, you know, if we didn't speak Japanese, that was a problem. Or if we didn't understand the food or like the food, that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. So it was a a kind of cause of consternation among um, Ryokan owners and workers, or at least that's what I found out later. But Mm -hmm. even in the 90s, when I first went to Ryokan, it seemed like it wasn't really designed for my consumption. It was more for domestic tourists. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in that... um, yeah, in the work that was taking place in these mm-hmm. in these uh, locations, like what kind of workplace was it? Who did the work? What did the work involve in order to make it feel number one so Japanese, and mm-hmm. then also to make it feel so welcoming? I mean, I felt completely pampered and welcomed, even though I thought the space wasn't really designed for me. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of where mm-hmm. I was, and the, that's the thing that really spurred this initial interest in Ryokan. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I think, you know, in, in, I don't know, over the past two decades, there's this more and more of uh, not just an awareness, but a specific targeting of the non-Japanese, you know, the inbound market. But probably, I guess, you know, back in the 90s and, and maybe like the 80s, it was, you talk about this in the book, but more of that, like the furusato, the hometown comeback, you know, kind of have this hometown experience. And it's almost like you're staying at your mom's house and she's taking care of you, like that kind or of grandma's like, house. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, you're going back to the family home, right? So that's like all in the, in the made for domestic mm-hmm. tourists. Yeah. That, yeah, that yeah, for that. the domestic tourists. Right, right. But over, over time, now, now they've got more like of an awareness and there's like actually, 
there is a huge market for the non Japanese market who wants to experience like real Japan, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what, what I, I mean, I didn't do this explicitly, but、mm-hmm. uh, an underlying question as we're just talking here is,、mm-hmm. you know, how, if at all, how have Ryokan changed in order to accommodate that market?、Mm-hmm. Or have they been more conscious of that market? Or in some cases, have some Ryokan done nothing to change because they feel like they shouldn't change that, you know, the Japanese ness of that package?、Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. That's something I get into a little bit later on in the book. I mean, we're jumping ahead of ourselves, but、mm-hmm. near the end of the book, I talk about the challenge and the contradictions of professionalizing hospitality mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. some people are. I mean, some of the people I worked with, some of the owners and the, even the staff, are what, I, what you might call purists.、Mm-hmm. They don't think anything should change. They think that the form of hospitality、um, and the way it is usually associated with a certain person that is the okami, that's the woman who's the co owner and, and, and um, um, the co owner of the family business and usually kind of. Is around the front desk area, not necessarily、mm-hmm. standing at the front desk, but she's, she's around, she's there.、Mm-hmm. Uh, some people feel like she should still embody the hospitality of the inn, and there should be no attempts at, at、um, professionalizing the form of hospitality in the ryokan.、Mm-hmm. And other people feel like because of、uh, more、um, particular domestic tourists、mm-hmm. um, and more international tourists. That there needs to be a kind of standardization or professionalization of the entire product. And、mm-hmm. even within the staff of particular inns, you have people who are fighting these internal battles on either side of this issue.、Yeah. And so that made for really interesting、um, moments for me while I was working at, at the Ryokan, where、mm-hmm. some people seemed to be going towards that very professionalization. Road and other people were fighting it at all turns. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, getting to hear those, those you know, employees that, that you were working with and, and like getting their perspective, and like, you know, when, when they bring in the person to、uh, for the training, the hospitality training and all that, and they're like, We already know how to do this. Like, just waste your money. <laughs> like, that was so we, interesting. We know how to do this. We、yeah. Actually, are, we don't want it to be professionally done. We don't want it to、yeah. feel like the same service you would get in a five star hotel、uh-huh. or on a J- Japan Airlines flight. It、right. should be different. It should be more personal. It should be a little, I, I wouldn't say messier, but it should be more like grandma's hospitality. Right. I mean, you would never have your grandma go to a, you know, to a Hilton and do training for three months before she hosted you for, a, a, for a, you know, the holidays. Yeah, <laughs> that's just not that's that would be so strange, right?、And、so, that's、right. how some of the some of the Nakai and some of the、uh, Ryokan owners feel about this、uh, question、mm-hmm. of professionalization or standardization of, of Ryokan. They really push back against it, right? Right, and then I, I totally get that, right? It's like you're trying to you know have that distinction between a hotel and a Ryokan, and if you go too much in the direction、mm-hmm. of a hotel, then it's like, okay, so what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, got the question、it. is、okay. like, why would I pay double or triple? Yeah. Because at a ryokan, you're paying per person、uh-huh. per night and you're not paying for the room. Right.、Uh, why would I pay double or triple or even more if the food quality is very high when、uh-huh. I can just stay in the same service quality in a hotel? Yeah, there's ju- just no reason for this. Yeah,、uh, yeah, yeah. To pay the extra. Yeah.、Um, all right. So then, how? So you, you worked at this one specific one for, for about a year, I think, but、yeah. you also you know, went, went to other ones you know, like for shorter periods. But. So, how, how did you like, actually go and, and what you showed up and said, hey, let me work here? Like, what, how did that all happen? <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> this all took place over time. I mean, this kind of ethnographic research,、mm-hmm. it takes a lot of time to do it, and it also takes a lot of time to get ready for it.、Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I was,、uh, while I was a master's degree student, I was working, <clears throat> pardon me. While I was a master's degree student, I was working more on questions of the landscape. And so、mm-hmm. I'd walk around Kurokawa and I would take photographs and、um, think about what had been built and why. And I mean, for instance,、um, there are some structures in Kurokawa itself that have become,、um, they have become older over time. I don't just mean that in a kind of、uh, 
natural way things become older because mm-hmm. of time passing. But but that people had purposefully built their structures in an older architectural style, mm-hmm. or they had taken down the the signboards that they had put up in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, and they had replaced them uh, with wooden signboards just mm-hmm. carved with their names out. So it's like they're going back in time, trying to make the Ryokan and the, the r- resort as a whole look like it's from an older time period. That's mm-hmm. what I mean, like mm-hmm. making it look older. So I was interested in that. And uh, while I was there walking around and, and talking to people, I met a lot of the owners. And um, I, I also met someone working at Town Hall. And he happened to be the tourism uh, kind of official in charge of tourism, and he took me around to some inns as well and introduced me to people, uh, the you know, inn owners, just to say, oh no, here's this foreigner, he's interested in in Kurokawa, mm-hmm. uh, you know, be please be nice to him. And so when it came time to thinking about a longer project for my PhD, um, I went back to some of those old contacts, and one in particular, I sent a, a message to. <clears throat> this is before. Uh, people using email. So I I sent a letter Mm -hmm. to the owner of one of the inns and just said, uh, here's my project. Um, I will work. I will put in the time, whatever you need from me. Um, I want to talk to people while I'm working. I'll try not to get in anyone's way. If I ever do, you know, of course, you can can kick me out, I'll leave. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, just planned for about a year. And so they approved it uh, and said, yeah, that's fine. Come on come on over. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and so I, so I started this in, uh, um, in August of 2006, I arrived and I started working full time, uh, you know, 40, 50, sometimes 60, 60 hours a week at this mm-hmm. one particular inn, mostly because I wanted to get a, a deep, rich sense of one workplace. Mm-hmm. Um, over time, as I started to pull back on my hours because I was just working so much, I was becoming physically, I mean, I had some physical issues uh, with my, my back and my eyes. And mm-hmm. so I, I pulled back on some of the work uh, at this particular inn. And then I picked up like half a day or a full day at different inns. Mm. And every time I went to those places, I would just say, well, you know me, I, I'm working at this place um, down the road. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, we've seen you around. We we've heard about you, and mm-hmm. say, can I just stop in for a day and uh, you know I'll wear my uniform and I'll try to stay out of the way. I just want to talk to some employees and um, see how things are different at this inn as opposed to that one. And mm-hmm. everyone was receptive. I, I no wow. one said no. Hmm. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, so that was good. Some people didn't. They wanted me to work during the kind of the cleaning hours mm-hmm. and not actually uh, in the evenings when I would be helping check people in. In mm-hmm. other places, I worked through the evenings all the way until the, the end of the day, you know, 10, 30, 11 at night. Mm-hmm. So that gave me a bit of a comparison, uh, comparative perspective on workplaces, these uh, Gyokan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also did some, as I pulled back even further from the everyday work, I did more and more interviews, uh, both with uh, Ryokan employees, uh, but mostly with the owners mm-hmm. and the next generation of owners. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, I was, I, I basically worked a full year at one inn, but I worked less and less over time. Mm-hmm. And then I filled in the space over the, the tail end of that year with some days here and there and with interviews. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huh. So, all right. So then like, what was a, a typical day? Like, uh, uh, like for example, at the, the place where you spent the most time at, like, what was, what was the job like? Yeah, what was the job like? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great question. So I wouldn't have known this before. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I guess I couldn't have guessed if I was just a. a um, I couldn't have guessed if I were only a guest. That's a terrible, <laughs> right. terrible little thing. Um, but yes, the day usually starts at seven or seven thirty, with uh-huh. us arriving and getting things ready for the breakfast, which is usually served in a shared large dining room between eight and nine, or sometimes eight and nine thirty, depending mm-hmm. on the inn. And of course, there's always some days where some guests have to catch an early bus or catch an early train or they have to catch an early flight. And so we'll serve them breakfast at 730. Or if it's very early, someone will prepare like a a, a small bento, some tamagoyaki and uh, onigiri to go so Mm -hmm. they can take something with them. 
Um, so we would get there at 7.30. We'd prepare for breakfast around 8 to 9. There are a lot of people running food in and out of the dining room. While uh, any guests who are in the dining room, the rest of us will go put away their futons mm -hmm. and kind of clean up their rooms a bit. We don't clean the room because the guests will come back after breakfast. Mm -hmm. And then they will still have to pack and, and get out of their yukata and, and other things and get ready and leave. And then we would clean the rooms. So that, that happens until, you know, this, this tidying up. And then washing dishes, uh, which was one of the things I did the most, uh, until around 9.30. And then at uh, 9.30, we'd have a, a tea break mm -hmm. until 10. So basically, what we're trying to do is just stay out of the guest's way. <laughs> uh, by 9.30, everyone's done with breakfast and they're in their rooms because checkout is at 10. Mm -hmm. And then we have time to uh, relax a little bit. Um, and get ready for the next busy thing, which is from 10 a.m. When all the guests have finally checked out, we can start running the vacuum cleaners and, and putting new sheets and uh, uh, um, pillowcases on, uh, putting out new yukatas, putting out new towels, uh, wiping down all of the and toilets and, and uh, vanities and the mirrors and the, and the, you know, basically cleaning the rooms thoroughly mm -hmm. every morning between 10 and 12 or 12.30. Uh, then I would eat breakfast, or sorry, eat lunch, uh, lunch around 12.30 or whenever you're done with your uh, cleaning duties. Mm -hmm. And then until 3, everyone has a break. So this is the time when um, check-in doesn't begin until 3. And uh, once we finish cleaning the rooms, there's really nothing to do at the real con. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would have a break, come back at 3, do small tidying duties like um, folding towels, putting more soy sauce in the containers uh, mm -hmm. that will be served or that will be used um, uh, even either in the big dining room or in people's individual rooms, those kinds mm -hmm. of small tasks Right. as guests are checking in. So anytime after 3 p.m., people can check in. And usually we want them to check in sometime before 6 because that's when the first serving of dinner can begin. Mm -hmm. And most guests do come in, you know, 4.35, they arrive. I would be out in the parking lot in the afternoons uh, and I would help people park their cars. Sometimes it's a narrow lot and some people have flown from Tokyo or Osaka mm -hmm. and they're, they're what they call paper drivers. <laughs> they don't oh. drive much <laughs> yeah. and they only rent a car to drive around on their vacation and normally they just don't drive. Yeah. So when I would say something like, okay, I, I need you to you know, back your car into this tiny space, some people would look at me helpless, helplessly <laughs> and I would say, I will do it for you. And that's all part of the, all part of the hospitality is like, well, I will even park your car for you yeah. and I will carry your luggage to the front desk and mm -hmm. I will help you check in so that you can just completely relax in this uh -huh. space. Um, so then, uh, you know, we would welcome guests. They would get a cup of tea in their rooms. They would get a kind of um, orientation to the space, where to find the baths, uh, where to find their yukatas, where to put their luggage, and what time their dinner could begin, six or seven. Mm -hmm. So at six and seven, I mean, basically from 6 p.m. onwards, I was in the kitchen helping wash dishes, helping prepare the dishes that are going out. I mean, I didn't do any cooking, but uh, there are some small tasks like putting plates and seasonal grasses like bamboo or other things on top of the plate Mm -hmm. which will then have a grilled fish placed on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I know how many people are staying in each room based on a whiteboard on the, uh, in the middle of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I know that at 6.30, there's a group of six people in so-and-so room. And so just at 6.32 or 6.33, I have a tray ready with six plates on it and six pieces of bamboo ready for the fish to be placed on it and then rushed out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. to be taken to the room and eaten at exactly the right temperature. Those mm -hmm. kinds of tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would wash dishes and help put out the futons whenever needed uh, until 9.30, sometimes 10 or later. And then uh, we would close down the kitchen and be done for the day. So roughly 7.30 a.m. until 10 at night with a two and a half to three hour break in the middle of the day between lunch and 3 p.m. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that. I, well, you're, you're basically at the hotel for over, um, well, at the Ryokan, whatever, but for over 12 hours on a normal day. On a normal day, 10 to 12 hours of, of work. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, and you're, you're physically there for more than 12 hours mm -hmm. unless you have somewhere to go during the break. Uh, right. Some people lived in a dormitory nearby. 
Mm -hmm. And so they would walk back, take a nap. Other people um, would have a car and they would drive home or they would have a car and they would go get their hair done or, you know, other Mm -hmm. tasks you try to do during lunchtime. I often just took a nap. (laughs) I just got so exhausted. I took a nap (laughs) in the um, unused spaces of the inn. Uh I wake up at at 2.55 and then, you know, wipe the... Futon, uh, wipe, wipe the sorry, the Tommy bits off my uniform and then go out, uh, get started. Yeah, yeah, huh. uh, hardcore. I mean, and, and I'll just say something about that. I mean, I yeah. think you're probably going to ask this question, uh-huh. but you know, is that number one, is that legal? Number two, why is this so intense? The the reason for the second question is, is something to do with what a Ryokan ideally or in practice or used to be and often still is, uh-huh. is it's a family business. Right. So the family business means usually, and in the past, it would be only a handful of rooms, and the family members themselves would live on site and do all of these things for guests. So mm-hmm. just like your grandma or grandpa who would host you, of course, they live there. Right. So they're, they're doing they're there all anyway, of yeah. this work in the background, and yeah. there's no there's no distinct, d- distinction for them. Uh, and so the there's been kind of a carryover of that style of labor even in busy places with 10 or 15 or 40 rooms, which need to hire an outside staff of non-family members to do all these tasks. Mm -hmm. The tasks themselves and the timing of those tasks are still linked to this tradition of a family business done by family members. Therefore, the labor kind of has, uh, it's continued. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is it legal? Okay, um, <laughs> no, it's not legal. And it's understood that it shouldn't happen, um, but uh, I don't know what to say, really. I mean, at the time, it probably was illegal, uh-huh. uh, but no one said anything, and it was understood yeah. that this is just part and parcel of uh, Ryokan work. Yeah. Now, in more recent years, I have talked to more owners and they acknowledge that this is the old style of work and they don't do that anymore. Uh-huh. They say that they pay overtime and they say that they um, they schedule workers' hours so that no one will work these uh, kind of required overtime hours. Right. Um, and I want to believe them. <laughs> uh, but I haven't gone back to do any more field work as a you know, working field work. So I don't know where's the line between what uh, – between uh, – ambitions and goals yeah. stated by owners and the lived reality of workers. I, I just don't know. Yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's a tricky thing. Right. And, and it's also the kind of thing where, I mean, you describe in one, one part in the book where I think you, you were either not scheduled to work or you were like a half day or something. And then mm-hmm. some, there was one, one uh, female employee who was washing the dishes and you, you felt bad because somebody else had to leave the, for the day. Yeah. And so you yeah. had to, you just decided to help her because she was all there by herself and there was a lot of dishes and you were just there. And I think that kind of stuff probably happens a lot, right? Yeah, it really does. Uh, so yeah, there, there was, um, at, this was early in my stay at this particular inn. I happened to live on site mm-hmm. and that was the, really the danger. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you live on site and someone suddenly can't work Mm-hmm. You just feel this social uh, compulsion to go help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some people you care about, and you, mm-hmm. uh, the the woman I was helping wash dishes, she was seventy two years old or something, mm-hmm. and so I I know she was um, she was a, an amazing worker, uh, but she would even say because of her age she was not as quick as she used to be, and it was a real burden to have her wash all of the dishes by herself. Usually mm-hmm. it was a three person job. So I came in to help and she, you know, uh, didn't praise me or anything. It was a small smile and a thank you and a uh, gokuro sama. Mm-hmm. Um, like, yeah, thanks for chipping in. Mm-hmm, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. And that, that happened a lot. Uh, there's another moment in the book where there was a typhoon coming and all the people who were commuters were told to go home, but the people who lived in the dormitory were called in to work that afternoon. Right. Even people who had scheduled that day off, mm-hmm. uh, it was just assumed and understood that because they were nearby and because the rest of us needed to go home for our own, you know, health and safety, uh, that those people could be uh, counted on to work. Mm-hmm. And there's something about this being a family business, and um, I suppose we'll get more into it in this mm-hmm. interview. 
in a few minutes, but the mm-hmm. fact that, that some of the people, some of the non-family helping in the family business are people themselves who are kind of uh, separated from their own families. Mm-hmm. And so they don't have a lot of um, flexibility and power in this worker employee uh, employee employer relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about next. And, and, you know, a lot of the book does focus on the fact that you know, many of the employees are, well, the Nakai is, is mm-hmm. the, the name of the position, but they're, they're female employees. And, and many of them are, you know, they, they've left their families or they got divorced or there's some, you know, issue where they had to leave and now they, they're living there. But they're in this, like, it, it's this, it, it, comes off as a, like a what is it like a double edged uh, sword? What was it? Double edged sword is that the thing, right? Like where it the, the, yeah. the position there it gives them a place, ways, yeah. right? Right, yeah. It, it gives them a, a place to work and they get an income, but at the same time, it, there's no like progression. They're kind of stuck there. It's it's it can be like sixty hours a week or something like that. But um, I don't know. Could could you give us a bit more context on that? Like who who are these employees sure. and what's the kind of situation that was? I, I don't know how it is right now. Maybe maybe it's starting to change and but what you saw, you know, when you were working there? Sure. Uh, the core of my co-workers mm-hmm. are Nakai. And mm-hmm. these are women who do the, the welcoming of guests and then they serve meals in the rooms and then mm-hmm. they clean the rooms afterwards. Uh, these are all strongly considered in Japanese society to be women's work. Okay. Mm-hmm. So who are the women who do this job? Uh, for the most part, uh, um, I shouldn't say for the, for the only part. I mean, everyone... <laughs> In my among my coworkers, with the exception of one person, were women who were either single, never married, um, divorced, separated from husbands, or um, yeah, those are the three. Yeah, divorced, mm-hmm. separated, or never married, and they were all in their forties, fifties, and sixties. Mm-hmm. So these are women who had lived in families and had their own homes for a while, but because of um, Gambling issues, affairs, um, dissatisfaction with their husbands uh, because of all kinds of, uh, in some cases, uh, physical ab- abuse, uh, some quite s- terrible situations. These women had felt uh, they needed to escape. They needed mm-hmm. to get away from that home. And um, at that time, and it's still understood that to be the case now, but I'm uh, really talking about this is from 19, uh, 2006, 2007 when I was talking to people. At that time and in the decades before, it was understood that Ryokan were an escape valve for such women. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter where around the country, there was always going to be a Ryokan that needed the labor of a woman who had experience doing the domestic chores uh, around her own house and taking care of her own family members and could then do those jobs in uh, in the hospitality sector. Mm-hmm. So I heard so many stories of um, uh, women who had called, you know, 2 a.m., called to the owner of a Ryokan and said, uh, I need a place to stay. I need a place to go now. I, mm-hmm. I can be there in a few hours. Uh, anything, uh, any work will do. Um, uh, first time I rode the bus in the Kurokawa area, uh, I was chatting with the driver and he was joking that the, uh, you know, he was unusual to see a foreigner. Mm-hmm. He hadn't had any foreigners on the bus before. He said, most of my uh, passengers are either elderly who don't drive and need to go to the doctor or women who are running from their ho- husbands. Mm. And he understood and he explained that as, as these are women who are going to Kurokawa in order to get a job in a ryokan because they are running from their husbands. Mm-hmm. So uh, that kind of general awareness of, of these women was there in the background. And mm-hmm. as I got to know my coworkers, I learned that they were all in, in such situations. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. some of them had just, um, I mean, one, one woman in particular, she said, you know, she married this this guy in her 20s and uh, her parents had warned her against him, always said it was a mistake. She acknowledges now it was a mistake. It was, you know, just a t- terrible, unsuitable person to marry. So she found liberation by, you know, being free from free of him. And she found liberation in having this job that um, gives her a sense of, of self-worth it pays her a good salary. Uh, it gives her accommodations, a uniform, three three meals a day, 
Uh, she gets to talk to customers every day and um, and be seen as a really useful, vital, important human being. She loves mm-hmm. that. At the same time, she acknowledges that her future is a dead end. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere to go up once you're a Nakai. There's there's just no there's no step up in the Nakai world, especially mm-hmm. in a very small business. Um, and the only thing you can do is maybe go horizontally to another ryokan for slightly better work conditions, but you will still only be a Nakai. Mm-hmm. And as I was saying earlier, there's this social element. If you are someone who called the Okami at 2 a.m. desperate for a job, uh, what do you think the power dynamic is between you and your and your boss? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you ask for extra time off and they say no, or you might not even bother to ask for extra time off because you feel you owe them something yeah. deeply. Uh, there's no negotiation. There's no, uh, you know, you wouldn't negotiate for a higher salary. You would always feel as if, okay, I'm in this dead end job, but at least I have something. Yeah. So yeah, I talk in the latter half of the book a lot about this, this um, strange set of circumstances in which all of these women have flowed into the ryokan industry. And it's not the ryokan industry's fault that so many women need these jobs. No, yeah. But they have definitely benefited from definitely, this yeah. amazing hospitality given by women who otherwise are, you know, in dead end jobs and have no uh, nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, like you, you, the 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 you 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 point out in the book how it's kind of the the division of labor is what is it the 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 sweat jobs and the makeup jobs is it was it is that what you yeah, yeah. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is really the about the men's job, men's labor and women's labor. Uh-huh. Uh, guys are are allowed to carry around a little white towel and and um and do all these jobs that that let them sweat. Uh-huh. And then they can wipe away the sweat and it, and everyone can see, oh, he's working so hard. Mm-hmm. But the Nakai and a lot of jobs, you know, not just in the Ryokan world, but in general in the service industry in Japan, uh, these jobs done by women are supposed to feel effortless. Right. They, of course, do involve incredible physical and emotional labor. But uh, if you were sweating... <laughs> And you had to wipe away your makeup, you would ruin the facade mm-hmm. that this labor is is uh, a labor of love and a labor that is effortless. Um, you know, when you are doing hospitality or any kind of service industry, uh, it's supposed to be done with a smile, mm-hmm. and the smile and sweat would contradict each other um, mm-hmm. in that in that very serious way. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, like I as as I was reading that part, I, I was reminded of. McDonald's in Japan. I, I'm not sure if they still have this slogan, but they have the smile on Murio, right? That's right. The smile is free. The, yeah. yeah, the smile is free. So you go. Zero, you know, they even they put it as zero yen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so. yeah you know, you right. can order whatever, but the, the employee will always be there smiling for you. You know, you don't have to pay extra yeah. for that. And then I was thinking, like, yeah, I guess it's free for McDonald's, but you know, the person has to actually smile. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're you're absolutely right. It's free for McDonald's, yeah. but it's not free for the for the employee. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. Right. Because, you know, they can get the a-hole customer and they still got a smile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that that's the that's the labor that, that you don't see, right? Like you see like, oh, you mm-hmm. know, she's chatting it up with the, you know, bringing out the food and this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it looks effortless, like you said. But, you know, behind the scenes, it's like they're complaining. It's like, oh, my God, these guys, like they keep on drinking and I, I got to <laughs> go, go home. Yeah, yeah I got, my, my kid is <laughs> at home or something. Home. You know, like yeah. you don't yeah. see that part, right? <laughs> you don't hear that part, yeah. And yeah. and it's not just, I mean, yeah, you, you say it's behind the scenes. There's a lot of that complaining behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. But there's also that it's it's actually the labor is in the body and in the emotions at the moment where you're you're smiling as hard as you can in front of the a-hole. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you don't save it for, it's just this internal strife within you. Like, oh, uh-huh. I really want to explode right now, but I cannot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had some of those moments. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, one customer in particular he was so abrupt and uh-huh. um, just he, he just could not reciprocate any kind of kindness or human uh, caring. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to pull his camper around to the front of the a camper van down mm-hmm. to the front of the inn. Mm-hmm. And um, 
I don't know if you've been around any ryokan, but there's not like a massive road to the, I mean, they, they just, they tend to have a lot of trees around and narrow paths so you can go down there、mm-hmm. and you might be able to pull a passenger car up to the front entrance, but you couldn't、mm-hmm. pull a camper van.、Mm-hmm. Uh, he gave me his keys. I walked up to the, the parking lot. I looked at the camper van. I'm like, there's no way. There's just no way. This can't fit. It's、mm-hmm. not that I'm not talented enough as a driver, but this car will not fit in that space. And I walked back down and I explained to him how it wouldn't fit. And he yelled at me to do my job and go get the car. <laughs> and I walked back up the hill. And then I stood there and thought, no, I, actually, I really, I really cannot do this. I'm going to、mm-hmm. damage trees. I'm going to damage his camper. He'll, he'll yell at me for that again.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and I went back down and said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but it just won't work. Because、mm-hmm. of the height of the trees and other things. And he took his keys away and he、uh, frustratedly、uh, said something to the, the inn owners and then he left.、Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like I wanted to, you know, maybe my American <laughs> perspective would have、uh-huh. right, been, right away been saying,、uh, oh, you know, I'm glad you had a good stay, but you know, you're crazy. There's no way your camper van's going to fit down here.、Yeah. I've measured it. I know how big this is. You know,、uh, sorry, we can't help you. Uh, but, um, but I couldn't quite get to that reality level, like, hey man, <laughs> this is、mm-hmm. just not going to happen. <laughs>、um, and he wouldn't have accepted that as the, as the customer. So, right, right. So, did, did he just drive away? Like, what, what, what happened? Yeah, he ended up just, just leaving.、That's、oh, jeez. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs>、um, I mean, he had stayed the night already. Oh, okay. He was okay, trying okay. to get、All、the、right. camper van down to the front gate so he didn't have to carry his luggage up. Oh, um, so, I mean,、okay. I offered, like, I'll carry your luggage up, but I,、yeah. I, I can't bring your camper van down here. It's just not going to happen. Yeah.、Um, yeah. Uh, but、okay. he refused. He carried his own luggage. He left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, look, in, in general, people are very nice and polite in Japan. I think that's, a, that's an okay gener- generalization, but there are ple- people like that. There, there totally are. So, <laughs> <Yeah> . um, <laughs> what, one, one interesting point in the book that, that, uh, Was kind of amusing, but also, you know, very,、uh, you know, it speaks a lot about, you know, what, what we're discussing right now is,、uh, you basically have do. Every single, almost every single job in, in, in the Ryokan, but the one thing that they won't let you do is actually serve the food, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't serve food because, and, and several people demonstrated this to me.、Mm-hmm. Um, to put it most bluntly, They said I didn't have the figure or the nimble fingers、mm. to delicately place <laughs> a, a, a teacup or a plate down in front of a guest.、Mm-hmm. There's something、um, assumed to be brutish about、mm. a man in general,、uh, no matter what his size or, his, or, or anything.、Mm. Uh, uh, women almost didn't need to be trained in the eyes of my,、uh, the people I interviewed, both、mm-hmm. the co workers and also the owners, female owners of inns. They just kind of laughed at the thought. They're like, of course not, which is, which is interesting. And this is, you know, you, you asked earlier about how have things changed over time.、Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that, that's changed is there's far less, in my experience,、uh, in Ryokan, there's far less serving of meals in rooms.、Mm-hmm. And there's far more serving of meals in a kind of general, large, almost like a restaurant setting.、Mm-hmm. And now it's okay for a man to serve a meal. In a restaurant setting.、Mm-hmm. Like I went to Dolgo Onsen, Dolgo onsen、mm-hmm. um, last year in February,、mm-hmm. and、uh, most of the staff who were serving the meals were men.、Mm. And it didn't strike me as strange because they were standing the entire time. They were more like,、uh, you know, professional, it was a professional、uh, restaurant style setting. Right. That's different from this、uh, Heashok, where you, if you eat, Your meal in the room,、uh, the nakai has to constantly be bowing and kneeling and standing and opening the door and kneeling again and closing the door. And it's such a private space because、mm-hmm. you know, your underwear might be over on the side of the room or、mm-hmm. there might be something else embarrassing that you wouldn't,、um, you wouldn't mind your grandma seeing, but yeah, you wouldn't、yeah. want some young 20 year old guy to see. Right. And I think that's what's going on in the back of the heads of, of the, the people I interviewed is to say, you know, if it were your room or if it were, you know, if you're your private room, you would feel less comfortable having a strange man come in、right. and serve the meal than to have a strange woman come in and serve the meal. 
mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. the strange woman is kind of an an every woman older like an older every woman who's harmless and right, right. caring but the man you kind of don't know could he be creepy or could he maybe do something or steal sure. something? i don't know i mean so i, I, I get it but yeah 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 yeah. So yes, I was told from the beginning, like I, I wouldn't be serving the meals. I was mm-hmm. okay with that. And then I pushed a little further by asking my coworkers and asking other inn owners, like, why do men not serve the meals in mm-hmm. the in the rooms? And then they would explain why. And mm-hmm. they would often demonstrate by plopping down a teacup in front of me and saying, yeah. This is how a man puts teacup in front of a customer, and this is how I do it. And they would show the smooth motion of their arm and pulling back slightly of the, the kimono if they were wearing one. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, I got the point. I didn't want to push further and say, well, I can learn how to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's nothing to do with my, with my sex, my gender. It's just to do with your impressions of what a man and woman can and cannot do. Yeah. 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 It's a chicken and egg kind of thing, I guess. Mm, Like it's mm, it's like mm. the society views it this way, but then, you know, the the kind of justification comes afterwards or something like that. And of course I would never want to make any customer feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So it's all about the customer. So yeah. yeah, And if that's the, how the in owners feel Mm -hmm. and that's how the, the other people feel, then of course the customers probably feel that way too. Yeah. And I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So if that's the general consensus, then okay, then I will, as a man, never insist on serving a meal in a yeah, room. Yeah, okay, fine. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it, but it's just one of those things that I mean, most people probably don't think about that deeply. But when you point it out, you go like, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Like I yeah. I, 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 ta- I told a friend uh, from, from Japan and like she, I asked her about this, like, you know, a man serving and it's like, and she was like, Oh yeah, that's true. I've never seen a man do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, after the meal is done and the people are either getting ready for bed or they maybe go to the bath and then uh, leave the room for a few minutes, a man will come in and put the bedding out. Like uh-huh. it's okay. I can go down and put the the futon out, but yeah. the actual serving of course by course, the kaiseki meal mm-hmm. and entering the door, uh, entering the room through the door and sliding everything. I mean, all of that stuff would be strange if done by a man. But coming in, just putting out the futons, that's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you, you just mentioned not, not too long ago, you, you went to, you know, Dogo Onsen, you probably mm. stayed at a Ryokan, I, I guess. And mm-hmm. so how, how do you how do you view Ryokan? Like, do you, I guess you still in, enjoy them as, as a, as a yeah. guest. Um, but what has, has your, I assume your perspective has changed somewhat or, but, but I, I don't know, like, what's your view now versus, you know, when, when you started all this, like, so long ago? Yeah. Okay, so uh, when I was in the middle of working at uh, the Ryokan for that year, I felt mm-hmm. a- awkward <laughs> staying at Ryokan. <laughs> I, I mean, you, I think you can't avoid it, yeah. um, feeling that way when you know all the work that's going on behind the scenes and, mm-hmm. and the ways people are <clears throat> uh, going out of their way for you. But of course, I also knew the pride that my own coworkers took and the pride that I took in the, in the job. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing... Uh, inherently, um, for instance, um, deprecating or humiliating about the work. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel guilty about making someone do this because it's a, it's a great job. It's wonderful way to, to, um, open yourself up to strangers and to, you know, give this level of hospitality that really is rare in the world where you're really saying to someone you don't know at all, like, I'm going to take care of you and you are welcome here. Uh, and it allows this um, extended face-to-face relationship, especially when you're serving the meal in the room, where the nakai would spend a full hour with their customers. They really got to know them. Mm. They played games with their kids. They talked about travel. They talked about the news. They asked people you know, about their relationships. They helped celebrate birthdays with them. Uh, all of these things can happen in that space. So I don't think there's an, anything inherently embarrassing or humiliating about the job. So when I go to a ryokan, I try to enjoy those things. I try to have conversations with the with the professionals without taking too much of their time. Mm-hmm. Right? Th- there's a balance. Like I know they want to have some short conversation. They want to make me feel welcome. But I also don't want to monopolize their time. Because in the back of their heads, they're thinking, oh, I still need to serve the fish to right. the room next to this one. Like, mm-hmm. I wish this guy would shut up so I can go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. go do my job elsewhere. Yeah. Like, there's a balance. And I don't know if I'm good at 
finding that balance, but I at least try to be, I try to enjoy it uh, Mm -hmm. as much as I think that the staff also try to enjoy it. Of course, it's a job, but there's something you can enjoy about it. In a way, like we were talking about McDonald's earlier, Mm -hmm. like the McDonald's interaction is so quick. You don't have any time to talk about anything. Yeah. But when you sit down for a meal at a ryokan in the room in particular, they're going to ask, how was the trip? Where are you coming from? Like some questions you can really then ask them, oh, you know, tomorrow we're going to leave, but we're going to, we want to have a nice cafe lunch. What, where do you recommend? Mm-hmm. And all of the local knowledge you've gained as an employee can, can come out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had, you know, had coworkers receive New Year's cards and thank you cards from guests. And some guests who are regulars, they keep coming back and mm-hmm. they keep asking for that particular Nakai. So I, mm. I knew Nakai who rescheduled their own days off wow. because a particular set of guests was coming back for their annual trip. Um, and that's that's wonderful to have that kind of long-term relationship with people you really don't know that well, but in that space, in that time, you mm-hmm. do get to know them. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, that's kind of what I'm part of, at least of, of what makes a Ryokan special from, from just your typical hotel, right? Like you get that personal yeah. attention, especially for somebody that's not, you know, from Japan, you know, you, you want to get a little extra instead of just staying at the, you know, business hotel where, you know, it's like a, <laughs> yeah. it's like a coffin almost, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and the, yeah, the business hotel is such the opposite of the Ryokan because yeah. as soon as you arrive, the room is so tiny, yeah. you want to leave as soon as you get there. Yeah. And as soon as you arrive in a Ryokan, you want to luxuriate and just do nothing. You never want to leave your room or you never want to leave the inn <laughs> complex, right? You might go out and take the rotenburo, the outdoor bath, and then you walk around the garden and then you sit and just take a nap in your room. And then you go for, you know, you do something else around there. But but it's just such the opposite um, motivator right. <laughs> of a business hotel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, last question. So you mentioned in one point in the book, um, you, when you were cleaning rooms, somebody left a tip. Is, how common okay. is that? Because I, I know tips are not common uh, in Japan, but is tips, that yeah. Ryokan, like different? Oh, so I was going to say this uh, to your previous question as well. Mm-hmm. Like, do I stay any differently or do I do anything differently? Mm-hmm. Yes, I always leave a tip. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know this was a thing. And, you know, I had kind of <clears throat> taken my Japanese studies classes before I I did this work and I had read all the things and people, you know, oh, in Japan, they don't tip. In Japan, they don't tip. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Tipping is very common in Ryokan. Mm. And it's either in the form of a gift. So mm. some people will buy, I know it sounds crazy, but they'll buy omiyage to give to the staff. Wow. As a kind of tip. Um, and it could be for good service given at the beginning mm-hmm. or it could be given at the end as a thank you. But some people will have small gifts like that. They will they will travel with and then give to the 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 inn staff. Mm-hmm. So every time we had our tea time at ten a.m., we always had treats from from <laughs> from uh, around the country. Yeah, uh, some of them were from. It was more common among regulars, people who had re- created a relationship with either a nakai or the inn or the inn's owners, mm-hmm. and there would there would always be something. Uh, from one of these people. Uh, but as far as tips are concerned, as uh, monetary tips were also common. I would mm-hmm. say almost every day there was one or two of the Nakai out of 15 to 20 rooms we had. Uh, mm-hmm. One or two of the Nakai would get a tip. And mm-hmm. we had a tip sharing program. So mm-hmm. everyone had to pool their tips. Mm-hmm. So it was enough, it was common enough that there had to be a um, a rule about pooling tips right? wow if it was super rare you wouldn't even have to sure yeah. it, but it was common enough and usually people would leave a tip of a thousand yen okay very common it's a it's a single note mm-hmm. the coin is a little strange so yeah. luckily the, you know luckily for the staff the thousand yen note is also it's quite valuable yeah. uh, but usually a thousand yen and wrapped in a tissue mm-hmm. or in something like a tissue uh, and placed in um usually Inns have a small wooden tray near the telephone or near the tokonoma, like it's somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And uh, that can be used to put any jewelry that you want to take off while you're bathing mm-hmm. or, you know, earrings or your watch or other things. But some guests also use that as a tip tray at the end. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Hmm. So it was it was fairly common. Yeah. And so I tried to leave a tip when I stay in, in uh, real calm. Nice. Okay. Okay. I, I, you know, I didn't know that, but it's good to know. And I'm sure some listeners are like, oh, okay, the next time. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, it's already really expensive. So I think yeah, some yeah, yeah. listeners will say like, are you crazy? I'm already yeah, spending, yeah. you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars to stay uh, yeah. for the two, two or three of us people. Uh, I can't afford to leave another, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I get that. I mean, it, it's... It's just interesting in the fact that, like, like you, you said too, like myself, you know, like at the restaurant, for example, you know, compared to how it is in the U.S., like you would never leave a tip. Like uh, you oh, hear yeah. stories about like some some foreigner leaving a tip and then the the, the waiter coming They'll out running like, you forgot your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That right, but, would, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, in a restaurant, of course, but right. not in a, in a real con, they would understand it's a tip. They would. You know. Right. Okay, no, so so good to know. I I didn't know that was a thing until I I, I read the book. But you know, not super super common, but not uncommon whatsoever either. So, yeah. Yeah. not everyone, but yeah. not uncommon. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I yeah. want to. I, I know you said it's your last question. Yeah, so yeah, I no. I, I want to take this chance to to say a little bit yeah. of something. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot about the work of the real con, and mm-hmm. I think it's really important. It's probably the thing that interested me the most. Mm-hmm. And while I was there, that's the thing I focused most on. Mm-hmm. But as I stepped away from the Gyokan and started reflecting on my time there, mm-hmm. and I kept going back and visiting the, the inns, mm-hmm. um, and some of my coworkers kind of had vanished. So I started talking more and more with the owners, mm-hmm. and not just the owners, but the next generation owners. And I think for readers who are interested in this, uh, there is this really interesting um, intergenerational um dialogue going on mm. between the owners of an inn and their own kids yes and the question of who's going to take over mm-hmm. uh, so it's i mean i focused a lot on the hospitality that is the face to face hospitality the day to day hospitality of the workers and the guests mm-hmm. but uh the first half of the book focuses more on the what i call generational hospitality Mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. the creation of the landscape in Kurokawa, but also the decision of who is going to take over this inn mm-hmm. in the future. And as we continue to hear about Japan's depopulation mm-hmm. and the strains on rural areas in particular, uh, this part of my book, I think, becomes more relevant because these are young people who have um, kind of grown up knowing they have to take over. Yep. But of course, they're taking over a place that is located in you know remote countryside mm-hmm. and all the other kind of more universal challenges with living in the countryside come in and some of them don't want to go back and live there yeah. uh, but they feel compelled to do so and i think their stories are really interesting yeah so very, I, very this other thing is um, yeah. that the book is really set up that way so the first half is mm-hmm. about the owners and the, the generational work and the second half is about the employees and the day-to-day minute-to-minute work yeah. And I even have the front cover of the book. Um, I explained the book idea to an mm. artist located in, in uh, who lives in Kumamoto. Mm. And she designed these, I mean, I commissioned these two artworks. Mm-hmm. One is the front cover, which is basically the hospitality from the perspective of the hosts and guests. That is the, the owners who are kind of standing in front of an inn. Mm-hmm. And the back side of the, uh, of the book Mm-hmm. Uh, it had to get kind of washed out because of the blurbs and other things, but mm-hmm. it's supposed to be the the backstage work done by all the employees, mm-hmm. representing the first half of the book and the second half of the book. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, that that other part in the book was also super interesting and just you know like trying to find the wife and you know moving away, yeah. coming back, and all that. super super. We we could t- probably talk another thirty minutes about that, but <laughs> yeah, for the sake of time, I know, but yeah, I yeah, just yeah. wanted to point those things. No, out. no, no, just... good, good to know. So I I do like like I said at the beginning, I I, I really enjoy these kinds of you know kind of long term studies because you really. You know, like numbers are always nice and you get to know like there's this many Ryokan and they're increasing in number and, you know, blah, blah. I mean, that's that's interesting. But I, I always like getting the like person perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Like somebody like mm-hmm. actually getting to hear the stories of these employees and why they're there. And, you know, like, is, is this person going to take over? Is this person going to move away? Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, those kind of, you know, actual individual stories. I always get sucked into those. So, yeah, <laughs> it was very, very interesting. Great. I'm yeah, glad you enjoyed so, it. Really um, 
for the listeners, you know, of course, link in the show notes if you're interested, go check it out. Uh, but uh, Chris, the paperback so is much. coming out. Uh, the paperback oh, pa- is coming out this month. This in January of 2023, oh. the paperback will yeah, be yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So that was that's the paperback. Much more, much more reasonable than the. I mean, the hardcover is sixty four dollars. I think paperback is twenty five dollars. So oh, it's gotcha. Okay, okay. I, reasonably I priced. Yeah. Didn't realize there was the 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 paperback was this month. I I knew, but anyway, yeah, this is coming out February first, so it's out, guys. Go cool. check it out. <laughs> yeah, go check out the paperback or get the Kindle version, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's that too. Also available. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing Thanks for your questions. Just do it.